Hello, Dan Flynn here from the Australian Christian Lobby. I'd like to welcome you to this very important and informative forum on LGBTI conversion therapy legislation. Um, most of you in this uh, forum, and there are many, many people here tonight, interested to learn about uh, the Victorian Premier's decision to ban uh, gay conversion therapy, whatever that is. What we do know is that back in February of 2019, Daniel Andrews said he would ban gay conversion therapy. He described it as uh, bigoted quackery, um, and he referenced, you know, the the, uh, the dark ages and torture, and that this was something that um, was abhorrent and that we all must agree uh, should not should not happen. The, the problem was though that uh, gay conversion wasn't defined in any way, and so um, we still don't know what it is. Uh, in total, but we do know some concerning elements uh, about it, uh, particularly in relation to the raising of children, uh, to the teaching of scripture, and to the um, the counselling of people in a clinical or pastoral setting. Clearly, the um, the purpose of tonight is to explore this legislation, um, and what we are what we hope are unintended consequences of the legislation. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at the negative impacts uh, on best practice care for young people uh, with gender dysphoria, um, the implications for the teaching of scripture in churches, and the burdening of freedom of adults to decide how to live out their sexuality. These are all things that we seek to uh, protect as the Australian Christian Lobby, uh, and uh, we are joined tonight uh, by a fantastic panel, uh, really uh, an international panel, and we're very, uh, very excited to have them. Um, uh, our first speaker tonight is Professor John Whitehall. He's a professor of, of paediatrics. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Carolyn Norma uh, from RMIT. Uh, she's coming in all the way from Tokyo tonight. Um, and uh, so we have a global perspective. And also uh, Reverend Murray Campbell, a pastor at Mentone Baptist Church. So perhaps the most appropriate thing to do is um, uh, I might go to our acting um, Victorian State Director, Jasmine Yuen, with a couple of questions. Jasmine, for many years you were involved in pastoral ministry in Victoria. Um, you've had a look at uh, the proposal in a, a discussion paper released by the government. Um, does that create any concerns for you in terms of the definitions of um, what could be pastoral ministry? Very much, it's very concerning. Even when I talk to my um, pastor's friends, they are all very concerned. Um, as pastors, we always um, use scripture and we always pray for uh, believers. And I personally have a few experiences um, counseling people with homosexuality and um, my person is one of them. Um, as pastors, we definitely can't avoid praying for them and explore the scripture, what it say um, about homosexuality. But under this proposed ban, if we look at what is banned, um, we have a PowerPoint. Yep. So if we look at um, the discussion paper um, in page two, it is basically listed out what they are going to ban is prayer scripture reading, fasting, spiritual healing, and deliverance. So it definitely is a huge concern for pastors. Um, Jasmine, you're also very connected with a lot of parents groups in Victoria. You're a young parent. I know as part of your work with the Australian Christian Lobby, uh, you meet and teach uh, with, with parents and uh, their concerns around what's taught in schools. How do you think that this proposed ban will impact parenting? As a young parent myself is um, very concerning again, um, because if you again look at what um, who is regulated, let's look at the PowerPoint again, um, taken from discussion paper. What is proposed is that um, they are considering of amending Family Violence Protection Act 2008 and um, try to amend it in a way to include 
um, subjecting a person to practices to change, suppress or eliminate an individual sexual orientation or gender identity. So what it means that um, if a child is um, experiencing gender confusion, as a parent, if this um, ban is passed or this legislation is passed, basically as a parent, I can't talk to my child or this any issue regarding gender orientation or gender identity. So it is very, very concerning for parents because basically it's taking away parental right. And you know, one of the other things that we're concerned about is, uh, you know, those who voluntarily of their own will uh, seek guidance or help in relation to their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and we are concerned about the matter of choice here. And obviously we're concerned about uh, those children who are, um, you know, uh, seeking help in relation to gender, there may be underlying issues. Uh, we're very concerned about that. <clears throat> and who better to speak about that uh, than Dr. John Whitehall? Dr. John Whitehall um, uh, graduated in 1966. Um, and in 1967, he commenced his work in paediatrics uh, in Vietnam and has done a lot of his work in the third world. Uh, he is still travelling to Bangladesh, uh, taking young doctors there to uh, just see how difficult children do it in the third world. Um, he describes his hobby as uh, uh, looking after the, the third world children. Um, uh, he doesn't have much time for hobbies, but he does have 19 grandchildren. Um, I wonder if you could welcome Dr. John, Professor John Whitehall. Thank you, Dan. Um, well, you certainly define it properly. I am a paediatrician and I'm going to confine my uh, comments to paediatrics, which makes the topic a little bit confusing. That this is a colloquial term, gay conversion ban, uh, but it really extends to children who are not showing homosexual issues, but are confused with their gender. So that's where I'm coming into it when I'm going to refer at all to adult issues. It really is a protest against the deprivation of a human right uh, to seek and to receive uh, help for unwanted mental preoccupations, including but not limited to sexuality. And the last thing I'm going to do is to mention a survey which is being uh, analysed now. It's formed by a man named Ed Sparrows from Melbourne. And uh, as someone says to speak up, okay, I'll, I'll speak up. But can you hear me in Melbourne? I'll shout. Um, it's being performed by Ed Sparrows in Melbourne and uh, online they have uh, sought the stories of people uh, who have been helped by what is now condemned as conversion therapy. But we'll get to that at the end. First of all, the issue with the children. Okay, so where does that fit in? You all know that there has been uh, almost an exponential increase in the prevalence of children uh, evincing uh, gender confusion. Uh, the, the number going to the Children's Hospital in Melbourne is much, much, it's gone up every year and so forth. Well, if, if you're going to treat it, then there are effectively two arms to the treatment, two diverging arms. And the first one uh, is to uh, send the child to a gender clinic uh, funded by the government uh, which will uh, most probably initiate a program of affirmation. In other words, the boy thinks he's a girl, you're going to affirm that the, the child is a, a, a girl, and you're going to bring about hormonal, you're going to change his identity, pronouns, dress, all that sort of thing. Uh, but then you're going to give hormones, uh, which will, in a way, uh, uh, try and bring his external appearance uh, into accord with his perceived gender. So uh, that is one arm of the treatment. And the other arm of the treatment is, well, hang on a second, we should look more closely at why this child is confused, what's happening in his family. And we should be assured by the statistics uh, that the majority, the large majority of these confused children uh, will in fact uh, revert to an identity congruent with their chromosomes through puberty, um, if you watch, you're watching, waiting, it's called watch for waiting uh, treatment, expectant, in, uh, confident in the statistics, and you would analyze and treat comorbid 
uh, mental disorders of which there's a common. And you would also look at issues in the family. Many of these children come in fact from the disturbed families and so forth. Then you would use psychiatric care if the child was too anxious or, or whatever. So this is a watchful waiting process uh, in expectation the child is gonna get better uh, with supportive and appropriate medical care. The other diverging arm um, is to send the child to an affirming clinic. Now, that sending it, not sending it to the, to the clinic is condemned as conversion therapy. This is really confusing. And I think they didn't mean confusing on purpose. So if you delay in sending the child to an affirming clinic, that's a sin of omission, a conversion therapy sin of omission. You, you are not sending the child in the direction it is argued it should go. More or worse, according to this logic, if you actually uh, sit down and try and work out what is going on here and treat the associated comorbidities and so forth, that is condemned as conversion therapy. This is really confusing. How did the confusion arose? It arose because in the past, um, there were uh, coercive, intrusive therapies imposed upon homosexual people uh, in order to try and bring them back to a heterosexual orientation. Nobody agrees with these these days. Um, they include um, coercive electroshock therapy, for example, uh, castration, uh, hormonal intervention, lobotomies on the head and so forth. No one agrees with that. And the question is, does it happen in Australia? Well, that's an interesting thing because I gave evidence to a parliamentary inquiry on this issue in Queensland where the Labor government up there was intent on criminalizing anyone who practiced so-called conversion therapy. For me, as a pediatrician, it would mean 18 months in jail if I didn't send the child to the affirming clinic and so forth, 18 months in jail. Anyway, the parliamentarians wanted to get the bottom of this and I wanted to know, well, how often does this occur in Queensland? None of the supporters for the bill could in fact come up with time and date and place. Oh yes, it's happening. Where is it happening? When is it happening? Well, not lately, not for years. So one parliamentarian logically said, well, hang on, you, you, you want us to put a, a bill in place here with an incarceration of 18 months for something that doesn't exist? Well, that's the issue. It, it, it's, that's the confusing issue. Now, um, what can we do about it? Well, I mean, it's a very serious matter because the Queensland Parliament was intent. They were hell bent on passing this legislation, uh, which would incarcerate and so forth. Um, but a spirited group of people, um, leader of a lesbian society, leader of a feminist society, um, a psychologist, a psychiatrist and others, and I was there too, we came and represented a whole range of, of people, but with the same opinion. I was saying that it was wrong when the child was going to get better uh, to submit it to this hormonal treatment. And they were saying, also, it was wrong, but there are issues of human rights here. And that the feminists were saying, well, we, we want women. We are feminists. And they were saying, not me, they were saying, uh, we don't want males uh, imposed upon us in this form when we have fought so with such difficulty uh, for women's freedom. And there are different ranges of opposition to it and uh, I wasn't involved in all those ranges. I was certainly involved in the children. So what happened? There was a spirited thing. Lots and lots of people wrote in. Over 650 people wrote into the parliament. 600 were against the so-called gay conversion uh, ban. And uh, in result, the politicians have pulled the bill back for so-called uh, better definition. In Victoria, at the minute, uh, there is effectively a de facto law, the Health Complaints Act, um, in which people uh, can bring to an ombudsman 
uh, accusations that so-and-so has tried to change my uh, sexual orientation. And the former Minister for Health, Anne-Marie Hennessy, said that it was an abominable thing, an abhorrent practice, and it ought to be uh, banned uh, completely by law. It drew, drew, and so did the Queensland Parliament, very heavily on a little report put out by La Trobe University, based on 15 the replies from 15 correspondents. That's it. And without any substantiation or whatever, these people said that they had been grossly uh, damaged by conversion therapy, and uh, the issue was, therefore, that it should be banned. Uh, people in the parliament down in Victoria wanted to criminalise it, but the La Trobe said, no, 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 we go for the lower, uh, lesser burden of proof which is necessary for banning under civil legislation. So that hasn't been inserted in the law that I know of, but it's a de facto issue. And, and Dan, you were saying at the beginning, where does, this, where does this lead for the treatment of children, for example? Well, already people are, are intimidated in Victoria. They're already intimidated. And who would want to get involved when the ombudsman could come and you could be shut down overnight? Now, Allied to that, uh, there's the APRA, which is Australian Health Practitioners Regulation Authority. They put out in 2018 uh, a new code of conduct for discussion. And in that was, for example, in 2.1 was basically a medical doctor who can be considered unprofessional if he or she makes public broadcasts that uh, disagree with the perceived wisdom by the college and therefore undermine community trust. And then part four, I don't know, three or whatever, uh, basically said a medical practitioner can be uh, deemed unprofessional if he or she makes statements that cause a member of the public to feel culturally unsafe. You see what that would do? That would mean that if the laws were passed to ban it, then the APRA would ensure that there would be no public discussion. It's a two-handed strangling of the right for freedom of speech, quite frankly. Now, we don't know what is going to happen for APRA. They have sat on that, and I believe, it's my opinion, that they were waiting to release it uh, to see what happened with the Queensland legislature. If the Queensland legislature had come out and said uh, conversion therapy is a criminal act, then APRA could say, well, this is not a moral issue. If you are out there giving public broadcasts uh, on, and you're criticizing this, in a way you are, um, you are furthering a criminal act and you could just be deregistered over that. This is a very, very powerful force. Well, um, because of all this, uh, some of us uh, wrote uh, 200 signatures altogether. Uh, we wrote to uh, Federal Minister Greg Hunt it was in 2019, and we asked for an independent inquiry. We put all the facts there. It was 83 references in on this, and how the problem is increasing, how there are side effects from the blockers that are not puberty blockers, the hormones that are not being mentioned, and so forth. And uh, people appear to be railroaded into this, children I'm talking about, railroaded into this affirmation therapy without due diligence or the success in the past of watchful waiting therapy. Well, we wrote to him. I wrote to him myself, cited myself. Uh, that was in September last year. He has not replied to me, uh, nor to acknowledge that there were over 200 doctors as well. Uh, but I understand uh, that the letter of the issue was sent to the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Now, I'm a member of that august body, um, and to ask their opinion on the behavior of some of their members is a bit like asking uh, the CFMEU bosses, would they like to uh, judge some of the actions of their members? This is a closed internal organization, not set up to judge ethical issues and to maintain standards of education. Not surprisingly, the RECP sent back, uh, this is saying that uh, um, we, uh, We'll leave this effectively to people who are already doing it. Uh, we should be having uh, national guidelines and we don't want a public inquiry. We don't want an independent inquiry because that's going to upset people. Well, 
or my reply to that would be that we had a public inquiry on, say, smoking, and we didn't want to make people feel regret or sad or whatever uh, that they had spoken, that they had smoked too much, but there was the interest of a future people. So I don't think their arguments help. Nevertheless, what the college was asking for was there should be better information, better informed consent and so forth. Now, what I'm, we are arguing in the, in the inquiry is that yes, all of the references to the fact that the children are gonna get better by themselves, to the fact that the blockers do have side effects, all of this certainly should be made public. So what did uh, Mr. Hunt do when he received that reply? Well, he's passed it on to the, uh, what do you call them, Association of Ministers of uh, Health under the COAG and uh, asking them for their opinion. Well, you know, um, most of those ministers, all of those ministers are already involved in the process of affirmation therapy. Why? Because they're the Ministry of Health and through that, the public health, the public hospitals are uh, funded, wages are funded, and so forth of the people who are in fact uh, performing the affirmation therapy. It is, it's fatuous to su suggest that the, minister, the state's ministers of health could come up with an independent inquiry when they're already really up to their eyeballs in, in the issue. So we are arguing that there should be truly an independent inquiry. I noticed today, and I was very pleased to see it, and I would refer you to it, um, an editorial in the Australian, which is in fact arguing the same issue, um, especially because it's come up for the number of children who are autistic, who are actually ending up in the affirmation clinic. We have known that for some time, we've been protesting for some time, but now the Australian is asking, is basically supporting this issue for a proper inquiry. Now, I'm sure I'm running out of time, and I just wanted to say something about adults. I don't know about adult homosexuality. That's not my issue whatsoever. But I have worked in a number of uh, developing countries, and I have developed a very, very sound um, appreciation of the issues of human rights and uh, the, the avoidance of their, um, of, of their transgression. Uh, this was... Pediatric care depends very much on the state being run in a democratic way. And therefore, I would extend my concerns to issues of freedom of speech and freedom of association and freedom of choice of whether you want to go to a doctor or not. You can go to the doctor, you can seek help and so forth. So I'm opposed to the banning of the gay conversion therapy now moving into adult things on the basis um, of promoting of the human right of choice. Now, lastly, I'll just go quickly lastly, because this is exciting stuff. This is the first um, research project that I know of uh, put, and was performed by its various and cause, what's cause, uh, Coalition Against Unsafe Schools, uh, in the same way that the Trove people advertised for stories. Um, have you been harmed by conversion therapy, particularly Christian uh, pastoring? then let us know and we'll take your story down. They had 15 respondents and one of them was so completely and utterly implausible that I couldn't believe one word of it. They were arguing that a teenage girl in this country uh, was taken in the middle of the night, incarcerated basically in some kind of an institution, was put into a bath with ice cubes floating in there and a, a man with a dog collar read the Bible over her. And then when this didn't work, uh, electric shock was applied to her genitals when she was looking at pictures of uh, lesbian situations. I cannot believe that that happened in Australia. Why? Well, look at whistleblowers on the Chelmsford uh, disaster and psychiatric care, the War 10B disaster in Townsville and so forth. And, and in any case, people were not talking about it. Now, they would be um, compliant, complicit in a criminal act because there was torture, there was kidnap and all that so forth. So 15 only very, very dubious stories, so especially the last one. And that Latrobe story was argued in Queensland to be the basis for the evidence that conversion therapy was happening here in Australia. Ridiculous. Now, 
in the same way, using the same uh, research methods, uh, it's Paris put out on the on the web. Uh, would you like to talk with us? Would you like to give us your data, your story as to whether uh, counseling had helped you with unwanted sexual preoccupation? So as we speak now, um, it informs me that there are 52 just 52 registered respondents, 27 of them have filled in their whole history, name and so forth. We can't give you their name, of course, but they have identified themselves and put their histories down. Um, 20, 27, incidentally, that's twice as many as Latrobe got. What happened to these people? Let's go through it quickly. 92% of them said that the counseling, 50% um, of the counseling, I might get this right. Um, yeah, yeah. Almost 60% of the counseling involved religious counseling. 17% uh, was professional counseling and 30% of them got better by themselves. So at least 50% of them there had Christian counseling. Anyway, what are they all saying? Let's go through it. 92% of them said their anxiety had been reduced. 92%, I can't hardly read my own writing, 92% said their self-image had improved. 83% said that they had reduced suicidal tendencies. 75% said relationships had, in, had uh, improved. And 80% said their physical health had improved. So this information should be brought out. This is counter information. It's twice as many respondents that Latrobe had for starters. And this is important for the Christian church because 50% of these people, one way or another, uh, were receiving what we call counseling. They're not receiving hormones. They're not being castrated. Their head's not being altered. But hang on a second. Who is receiving hormones? Whose head is being altered by hormones? Who is being chemically castrated? Who is even being surgically castrated? That's the children who pass through the so-called affirming centers. There's a big hypocrisy here. Dr. Dr. Whitehall, um, thank you so much for that. Dr. Whitehall, thank you very much uh, uh, for your very clear presentation. And, you know, it's telling that you say that, you know, when you gave evidence and made inquiry in the Queensland setting, that there was no uh, evidence of any, you know, torturous practices. And, um, you know, clearly uh, the Australian Christian lobby, uh, we would condemn any, uh, you know, coercive practice. Uh, clearly we do. And, you know, it's important, um, I think, for people to be aware that, that we are seeking to deal with really um, the consequences uh, of this ban, uh, not on things that we all agree are bad, but the consequences on counselling, on uh, child raising, uh, on uh, houses of faith uh, teaching Christian doctrine. You know, uh, Dan, have, uh, Dan, can I just say that I completely agree. I, I do not agree that there should be any coercion. I abhor that coercion. Uh, does it happen now? No, there's no evidence that it happens now. Am I advocating for it? Not the slightest. I'm advocating for the freedom of choice within this, and I'm certainly advocating for the uh, non coercive watchful waiting program for confused children. That's excellent. Uh, Professor, we're all, on the, we're all on the same page in relation to that. Um, so um, we, we have tonight a medical contributor, uh, a feminist contributor, and a, a member of the clergy. Uh, so there's, there's plenty, plenty of perspectives for us. I suppose in relation to our call to action tonight, we would encourage you to listen carefully, take notes, um, Think about how you can inform uh, your church minister, your friends about this, and ultimately, when there is a bill tabled in the Victorian Parliament, how you can inform uh, members of Parliament. So um, stay tuned to this excellent information. Our next speaker, Dr. Carolyn Norma, uh, has two bachelor's degrees, uh, two master's degrees, and a PhD in political science. So um, Carolyn uh, is in Tokyo. Uh, she's a senior lecturer and um, we're very honoured to have you here tonight, Carolyn, and we um, 
Uh, really look forward to hearing your particular perspective in relation to this LGBTI uh, conversion therapy ban. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, and thanks to Jasmine also and uh, Professor Whitehall. Um, and it's an honour to be able to speak on the panel, particularly uh, with the other two speakers tonight and to uh, have so many people tuning in. I'm really uh, honoured to be here. Um, I particularly liked uh, Professor Whitehall's comments on democratic process, uh, freedom of speech and association uh, that this issue brings in uh, from my perspective. Uh, because actually when uh, my participation in this forum was announced uh, online, uh, it was met with uh, outrage, both faux and real, um, when Facebook users got wind of it. Um, colleagues in my university department uh, then ran to the tabloid press to assure the Australian public they wouldn't be so-called silent observers in the face of such heresy and pledged to, quote, use their academic privilege to support legislative measures in Victoria and other states to ban conversion therapy. So exercising this privilege in a maximal way, the same colleagues then touted for signatures for an online petition, rejecting, quote, harmful practices such as conversion therapy deemed a form of ethical malpractice that has no place in our healthcare system. Then, according to the 230 people who lent their names to the petition, including directors of RMIT, RMIT University Research Centres, quote, conversion therapy is causing real harm in Victoria and so required are legal changes by the Victorian government to, quote, clearly and unequivocally ban conversion therapy. But as confident as the petitioners might be, the Victorian government, for its part, uh, as we've heard from Professor Whitehall, uh, doesn't know actually whether or not conversion therapies are causing real harm in the state. Uh, this is because uh, the Department of Premier and Cabinet, the Victorian uh, Department, soon after chipped in money for La Trobe University to assess its prevalence, given that, and this is according to the text of the, the successful funding application that went through, quote, little is known about their impacts uh, of, of gay conversion therapy or the extent of their practice in Australia. But why then, uh, is my question tonight, would the Victorian government take legislative steps to ban gay conversion therapy? And why then would university academics uh, launch protest action to discourage debate about it if such practices aren't much known about in Australian society? Um, in fact, though, as we know, uh, and certainly Professor Whitehall knows more than anyone, the push for laws banning gay conversion therapy is happening not just in Australia. Similar laws have won a number of, uh, have been won in a number of overseas jurisdictions over the last two years, particularly, most notably Germany, and I'll come back to Germany. There are Canadian and Queensland bills in the pipeline, as Dan mentioned, and the Victorian government, as my petitioner, protest petitioners uh, reminded us, is consider considering similar legislative uh, directions. Uh, important to note though about these laws, uh, both in Australia and overseas, is, is that while they come wrapped in anti-gay conversion therapy rhetoric, as Professor Whitehall mentioned, they are concerned less about gay youth than patients professing uh, a gender identity. They prohibit uh, therapeutic interventions aiming to change not only sexual orientation, but also an individual's internally experienced feelings of conflict with their biological sex. They mandate, as we've, we've heard, an affirming approach to individuals claiming a transgender identity, which requires a range of interventions uh, to relieve uh, gender dysphoria. Um, such as, in addition to, to the things that uh, Professor Whitehall mentioned, also things like uh, behavioural coaching and training to become uh, more so-called feminine or more masculine, things like prosthetic penises and chest binders, um, all of these uh, services are linked to uh, affirmation approaches. Not recommended though are alternative approaches that encourage acceptance of one's sex and which importantly for my discussion uh, tonight comes with uh, encouraging acceptance of one's sex also comes with exploration of possibilities for living as uh, gay or lesbian. 
Failing to affirm an individual's claim gender identity was deemed an exercise in conversion therapy, uh, first in Canada over five years ago. Um, psychiatrist Kenneth Zucker, head of the Toronto-based Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, uh, for 35 years, uh, but he was sacked in 2015 and the centre was closed. This was done on the accusation that staff at the centre were undertaking conversion, so-called conversion therapy, in their efforts to encourage children presenting with gender dysphoria to accept their biological sex. Now, these efforts were sympathetic and uh, intensely therapeutic. Uh, they included encouraging a child's friendship with same-sex peers uh, and so-called play therapy where practitioners would attempt to understand why the child was seeing the opposite sex as a better fit for them. So no element of convert, uh, coercion in them. But this kind of, in, it has to be said, this kind of intensive time-consuming and bespoke therapeutic interventions with gender dysphoric children is absolutely a thing of the past here now in Australia. Today, now, five years later in Australia, we have gender clinics operating out of children's hospitals, as Professor Whitehall mentioned, that are overwhelmed by escalating numbers of young people, mostly biologically female, requesting treatments like puber puberty blocker drugs and hormone therapies. As has been recently reported in Australia, uh, the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne currently has 383 young people on its books, of whom 275 are biologically female. So that is 72% of children on the books of the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne as biologically female. But these children are quickly affirmed in their claimed uh, gender identities because this is the cheapest option with such large numbers of patients. Uh, it takes much less time and resources than alternative approaches like Zucker's. By the way, hospitals in Australia are also subject to uh, government performance targets uh, for patient waiting times. So when we have these gender clinics incorporated within uh, public Australian hospitals, their patients too come to be incorporated in these statistics about waiting times. Now, of course, uh, for patients seeking necessary surgeries and treatments uh, in Australian hospitals. We absolutely want to reduce waiting times and the government should be uh, monitoring them in public hospitals. But this is very different from the situation we face with gender clinics where children are presenting uh, with uh, gender dysphoria and being because of these wait times, these wait time monitorings and um, uh, incentives, uh, performance incentives to reduce wait times, uh, they are quickly moved along to potentially uh, puberty blockers, hormones, and even potentially potential surgeries uh, as a result of those kind of considerations. Also, even though these children are being affirmed supposedly to relieve their gender dysphoria, considered to be a mental condition, Ironically, um, particularly in the case of Queensland, uh, they don't uh, come to be registered in the statewide mental health clinical record. So a mental health uh, file is not raised for children going into gender clinics. So to the extent that they are considered medical patients, of course, a normal clinical file is raised. Um, uh, but this is very different from raising, in the case of Queensland at least, different from raising a mental health file because uh, Queensland has a statewide uh, system of registration in that case where joined up services um, to assist youth mental health uh, can coordinate to give the, the best possible support to those young people. That doesn't happen uh, for gender clinics because then they don't, uh, a mental health file is not raised. Now, for the laws proposed, like the law proposed for Queensland at least, and some of uh, its components will likely form a blueprint for Victoria. Um, that law locks in a requirement for practitioners to respond in this kind of roughshod way uh, to vulnerable youth seeking help through uh, the country's publicly funded gender clinics. Uh, the laws in the, the, the current way that we have them um, drafted in Queensland and in other countries potentially criminalise thera therapeutic approaches that encourage acceptance of one's biological sex and alternative exploration of one's sexuality as gay or lesbian. At the same time, the laws deny that treatments or medical interventions relating to gender transition themselves comprise a form of conversion therapy. Uh, the Queensland law, for example, is adamant uh, that enthusiasm for gay or lesbian conversion will not be alleged 
of practitioners who, quote, assist a person to express their gender identity. But not everyone is convinced of the virtue of practitioners who adopt this exclusive approach. Uh, Holly Lawford-Smith at the University of Melbourne writes of the Queensland legislation specifically, that it makes it a criminal offence to do anything other than affirm the identity, gay or trans, that a kid claims to have. So if a confused kid that's actually gay comes into the clinic claiming to be trans, the clinician would have, uh, would have to affirm him. If a confused kid that is not trans comes into the clinic claiming to be trans, the clinician would have to affirm him. So in the name of not converting gay kids to straight, we're now converting gay and straight kids to trans. And Sheila Jeffries, uh, formerly of the University of Melbourne as well, in her 2004, uh, 14 book, Gender Hurts, notices the same problem and flags some of its poss possible outlying consequences by drawing analogy to the old practice of eugenics. Uh, Jeffries writes that, quote, lesbians and gays were targeted by eugenicists and those with same-sex sexual orientations are in practice a principal target of the sexual surgeries of transgenderism today. The practices are connected too in that they are both supported by persons who had an otherwise progressive agenda, both eugenics and today's transgenderist um, uh, claims, such as sexologists who are often socialists and some feminist in the past, feminists in the past, and this is certainly true of the practice of transgenderism today, Sheila Jeffries writes, which has been supported by many on the left and many feminists, which is uh, the case in Australia as well. Um, as people here will already know, uh, sterilising women with physical or intellectual disabilities, mental illnesses or hereditary diseases was a policy enacted by so-called modern states uh, be even before the war and enforced right up until the 1960s. So as a result, uh, governments in countries like Japan today, where I am, uh, face continual court claims brought by survivors for state reparation for what was done to them, sterilisation. Uh, these claims actually are in Japan's courts almost constantly and almost constantly the claimants, so that the survivors of uh, eugenicist policies win uh, in uh, their claims for reparation against the Japanese state. Uh, states like Germany, who now enforce uh, affirming approaches uh, to underage gender dysphoria, so they enforce them as the only approach, and therefore potentially facilitate the sterilisation of young patients through drug therapies, run, I think, run a similar future risk of damage claims brought by affected citizens. Uh, this is because the new law in Germany, for example, bans conversion therapies uh, through, through its ban on conversion therapies, it effectively enacts a state enforced ban on alternative treatment op options for gender dysphoria. So it's the, uh, the range of treatment options that is uh, at, at issue, uh, I think, in these, these laws that are being enacted. So they're cutting off options for various approaches to treatment when children present with uh, gender dysphoria. So, but given Germany's history of eugenics, it's unfortunate, I think, uh, the public debate about transgender healthcare is suppressed in that country, just like it is in Australia, through the demonization of people offering opinions on the topic. And that's similar to the campaign that I faced uh, in, in Australia in relation to coming to today's forum. So uh, to conclude, um, People like my university colleagues, Australian gender clinic operators and MPs in the Victorian Parliament would not consider themselves uh, conversion enthusiasts, either of uh, gay children or otherwise, they would not. But I think uh, their knee-jerk cheerleading for legislation mandating affirming approaches and only affirming approaches to gender dysphoric youth enacts a roughshod clinical response, I think, to vulnerable young people. Uh, this approach is motivated, I think, by some neoliberal money-saving considerations. It's a quick and easy and cheap way to push through large numbers of children through the system. Um, but it's also more fundamentally prefaced by a, a insufficient care and thought about the need for individually tailored therapeutic responses, especially in the case of children. Young lesbians and gay men, I think, risk falling through the cracks of an ill-considered uh, legal and healthcare structure that arises because public debate about transgender healthcare is suppressed. Um, if therefore, and, uh, my university colleagues 
uh, wish not to be mistaken for gay conversion enthusiasts themselves, I would suggest that they need to explain how criminalising therapeutic approaches that encourage acceptance of one's biological sex uh, does not erase sexual orientation as a clinical, important clinical focus. So in other words, um, I think uh, we need an explanation uh, before we go any further, as to how mandating an exclusive focus on gender identity does not erase lesbianism and homosexuality as positive and healthy options for resolution of problems of gender dysphoria. And I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Caroline. <clears throat> we appreciate, Caroline, thank you. Um, we appreciate very much your courage uh, in uh, presenting at this forum, as you've indicated, and um, uh, your voice is an incredibly valuable voice in this debate, and it, it shows us all that the um, the issues of um, uh, male and female are, are not uh, really merely religious issues, uh, but uh, truth is truth uh, right across the spectrum. Uh, thank you very much for coming in all the way from Tokyo this evening. Um, our next speaker uh, is a minister, Murray Campbell. Murray Campbell has been the lead pastor uh, of Mentone Baptist Church since 2005. Uh, he is a prolific writer. Uh, he blogs under his own name, particularly on Victorian political issues, and has blogged on this particular issue. Uh, his um, political in antenna uh, is very good, and so is his pastoral warmth towards people. Uh, he's, um, uh, he describes his hobbies as being busy with his young children's sport, uh, and uh, he also has a greyhound named Claude. Over to you, Pastor Murray Campbell. Thanks, Dan. Uh, it's good to be here and to be listening uh, to the other speakers, as well as to have an opportunity to, to share some thoughts. Uh, I just want to preface my remarks, though, by uh, offering two brief remarks. Uh, firstly, the, the presentation I'm about to give, I don't want it to be read as a, a political evaluation of the government, because that's not where I'm coming from. And second, as I speak, I often like to remind myself of the, the words of the Apostle Paul, who says, uh, he, here is a, a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. So you know, in other words, as a Christian, I can't be uh, looking down on other people. It doesn't mean that I'm agreeing or affirming every idea, but it does mean, though, that one of the implications is every single person is made in the image of God and therefore has uh, inherent worth and dignity. And so that's going to uh, impact the way that I, I look at other people, including those I disagree with. Now, uh, the Victorian government has been uh, re relying heavily on two reports that I'm going to be referring to throughout my presentation. Uh, firstly, there's the Health Complaints Commissioner's Report, or the HCC, and there's the Human Rights Law Centre Report, or the HRLC. Now, uh, with this time that I have with you, I want to address two points in particular that relate to churches. Uh, the first one is this. Gay conversion therapy is rare among churches, not widespread. It's rare among our churches, not widespread. Uh, back in 2017, a journalist from the ABC gave me a call and asked me about gay conversion therapy. Uh, I must have been a rather poor interviewee because they didn't run with a story at the time. Uh, and the, the, uh, the questions were rather easy to answer because I didn't know the answers. <laughs> I was explaining to him uh, that I, I didn't understand. Well, what is this gay conversion therapy? Uh, I asked him, what did he mean? He wasn't sure himself, but he did share a couple of anecdotes with me. And I responded to him saying something like, well, that sounds awful. I don't know anyone who, who practices this and I couldn't even tell you who to speak to about it. And in fact, I, I wouldn't want anyone subject to that kind of counseling, but I don't know of anyone who ever has. Now, I understand that in, in my role as, as a pastor and, and because of my writing, I speak across many different churches and Christian denominations in the country. And this was like a brand new thing to me. But you see, Victorians have been given the impression that conversion practices are widespread across the state and they're endemic uh, within religious organisations, especially amongst Christians. So one of the reports says this, quote, the ideology of conversion therapy movement has become mainstreamed in many conservative Christian communities, unquote. That is simply not true. Now, it seems that there have been a few religious groups in the past who have engaged in some kinds of conversion therapy, but it's unusual. 
It, it's not normative among Christian churches. Now, the, the research that was commissioned by the Human Rights Law Centre and La Tribune, uh, what they did was to recruit subjects through uh, advertising on LGBT websites and social media groups and through various queer and ex-gay survivor networks. And a total of 15 people from across the country came forward as a result of all of that. And 15 came forward and were interviewed. In, in fact, gay conversion therapy uh, doesn't have its roots in, in Christianity at all. It's not a Christian practice. It comes from, a, from strands of secular psychology that used to be prevalent in, in the 20th century. And, and it seems that perhaps a few marginal groups adopted some of this thinking, but I don't know of any organizations who are involved in this today. Now, none of that takes away from those 15 people who came forward and shared their stories. Uh, their testimonies sound rather disturbing, uh, but these practices have pretty much zero support amongst mainstream Christian churches and theology. And as a Christian pastor, as, as, as a parent, I, I don't support or agree with uh, gay conversion therapy in terms of in defining in terms of pseudo scientific and medical and unbiblical spiritual methods to change a person's sexuality. So that's the first point. Uh, gay conversion therapies are rare. It's a rare practice, if at all today. Uh, the second point I want to make has to do with a proposed definition that the government is playing with at the moment. On the, the Premier's website, you can read the suggested definition for conversion practice. It says, quote, there's two points. One, any practice or treatment that seeks to change, suppress, or eliminate an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. And two, including efforts to eliminate sexual and or romantic attractions or feelings toward individuals of the same gender or efforts to change gender expressions. Now, the government's acknowledged that there are narrow and broad definitions available, but they've chosen to accept a broader definition one that was supplied by the HCC. Uh, it's worth asking the question, why is the government asking or rather choosing a broad definition rather than a narrow one? And we need to be clear that the, the proposed definition of conversion practice includes more than a, a psychologist clinic or a counseling room. So the uh, HRLC report says it wants included under the umbrella of, of uh, conversion practice, quote, pastoral care which includes counseling, healing, claims about curing or changing or, or repairing a person's sexual, uh, sexual orientation or gender or identity, or claims about improving a person's mental or physical health would likely be classified as a health service and the above regulations would apply. And pastoral care, which refers to faith-based support includes spiritual guidance, prayer and Bible groups, unquote. So the definition is so broad it can include sermons, Bible studies, marriage courses, counseling, and even prayer. Uh, the HRLC report also includes new forms of conversion practice, including promoting self-control and abstinence. So under these report, conversion practices are including, quote, they are beginning to promote activities designed to help same-sex attracted people live chaste and celibate lives in accordance with the sexual ethics of their religious traditions, unquote. As one academic who uh, is in the, works in the field of gender studies uh, said to me in private, she said, according to this above assertion, self-control is conversion therapy. Let that sink in. In one quick stroke, significant portions of the Bible have to be removed. <laughs> and the examples don't end there. So in the, in the same report, affirming the historical and biblical definition of marriage is also considered a form of conversion therapy. Quote, this welcoming but not affirming posture equates to a more sophisticated version of the old evangelical adage, love the sinner, hate the sin. LGBT conversion therapy is not prominently promoted. However, LGBT people worshipping in communities that present cisgendered heterosexual marriage as the only form of gender and sexual expression are positioned to repress or reject their LGBT characteristics and to seek reorientation. Now, without significant revisions and clarification, the government's plan to, uh, to ban conversion practices will be used by some in our community to stamp out what are normal and deeply held convictions within our religious communities. 
In fact, the, the government has already admitted that it's prepared to further limit religious freedom. Let me quote. This is from uh, the government website. Both the HSC and HILC reports highlight that many modern LGBT conversion practices are religious rather than medical in nature, in that they involve or consist entirely of pastoral and prayer activities. The impact of a ban on conversion practices on the right to freedom of religion may be justified given the nature and extent of the harm described. So the government here is assuming that sexual rights are more important than religious rights. Now understand that's a false binary because a person's understanding of their sexual morality is always attached to their religious worldview. You can't separate the two entirely. Our sexual expressions is an expression of, of our deepest convictions about God and the world and what we believe is good and true. But also, though, to justify limiting religious freedom, the government have acknowledged and they, they've acknowledged that they're doing that. But the government wants to use the argument of harm. So to justify limiting religious freedom, they're using the argument of harm. And that's important to understand. Now, certainly, we don't want any Victorians, including uh, gay, lesbian, transgender Victorians being harmed. But the description of harm is extending well beyond those few extreme examples that we've heard about that may have happened in, in the past about physical coercion and psychological abuse. So, for example, the HSC reports includes under this umbrella of harm, quote, conversion therapy practices reinforcing homosexuality as a form of brokenness and church teachings that homosexuality is sinful, All right? So to be clear, what it says is classical, classical uh, Christian teaching about sexuality is harmful. So a sermon on Romans chapter one or a Bible study on 1 Corinthians chapter six would fall under that umbrella of harm. Or if your church organizes a marriage enrichment day or and the Bible is being presented, a Bible view of marriage is affirmed. That could equally fall under that umbrella of harm harm. Now we know that there's a massive difference between offering someone shock treatment or performing a supposed exorcism and reading the Bible with someone and them concluding that they no longer wish to identify as same-sex attracted or transgender. But will the Victorian government make that kind of distinction? Now, I do believe religious institutions have a responsibility to prevent harmful therapies or practices, those that are genuinely harmful and wrong. I can't speak for other religions, but I know that the aim of Christianity is not even to change a person's sexual orientation or gender. The Bible calls on Christians to be sanctified or to be holy. And now in becoming a Christian, so many gay and lesbian people uh, don't become heterosexual. When people become Christians, though, there's always a change in life. I mean, what, what point is there in becoming a follower of Jesus if nothing changes? Now, let me repeat, that doesn't mean that if someone becomes a Christian, they no longer struggle with their sexual orientation or, or gender. But what it does mean is that with their whole life, they want to be godly. And according to the Bible, sanctification includes affirming that uh, sexual relations are only for within the, the loving, exclusive, mutually consenting covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. Now, the fact is, though, while many same-sex attracted people don't change their orientation when they become Christians, some do. And for the, the reports that the government is uh, using and relying on to ignore that fact is grossly negligent. I think that the question is, uh, from a, a church kind of perspective, is, is this. Is this going to be conversion by uh, coercion or conversion by choice? Now, as it stands, the government's proposal is nothing short of forced conversion. It is the state telling the church what we can teach and say and pray and practice about sex and gender. On the other hand, though, Christians don't believe in, in forced conversion. We, we believe in persuading people with a, a message that's good and attractive. Christianity is by definition a conversion religion, isn't it? It's conversion to Jesus that results from a person being convicted and choosing to follow Jesus. I think all Victorians, whether they're, they're Christian or religious or not, should be concerned by the, this latest uh, endeavour by the government to, to, to ban conversion practices. 
Let me reiterate, the government is indicating more than simply banning practices that have proven harmful to a few individuals in the past. No, they're, they're proposing to force convert religious organizations and churches to abide by some new sexual ethic. So I guess in, in the future, will churches and religious organizations here in Victoria have freedom to preach and teach and cancel and pray in line with our convictions? The answer to that question at the moment is far from conclusive. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much, um, Pastor Murray. <clears throat> We've heard some very confident um, presentations tonight from people from different perspectives and um, what a privilege that has been. Do you know, you, you can place a question on the q and I see there's uh, some 15 questions there. So in the uh, few minutes that remain, uh, we'll address these questions. Um, <clears throat> I might go to uh, Jasmine for the first question. Um, um, and, and Jasmine and I will um, sort of co-host this Q&A. Uh, but just before I do that, um, I would alert people to this fact. There has been, as I understand, a bill uh, prepared uh, that uh, is, is to go before Cabinet. Uh, on uh, banning um, this so-called LGBTI conversion, uh, which we can expect to have many of the um, the quite unfair aspects that our speakers have referred to. Uh, so we will be calling you to action on a campaign uh, when that legislation becomes available uh, so that you can have conversations with your elected members of parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in a democracy. It's our uh, right and our responsibility to participate in that. Uh, so um, we, we're not afraid of that battle. We know it's coming and uh, this is all preparing for that. Jasmine, I might just uh, throw to you for your for the first question. Yes, the first question we have, but well, probably um, Pastor Murray, you might want to answer this one. So I'll read it out to you. Mm -hmm. I'm running fatherhood courses and with my wife, marriage courses through the local churches. And a couple of other participants have big concerns with having homosexual children. I'm wondering how far we can go to help um, to help them means the parents and the children. And are we allowed to talk to them about it? Can we pray with them? So to you, Pastor Murray. Sure. Uh, yeah, good question. And uh, it is, it's a pastoral uh, question. Uh, a couple of things come to mind at the moment. Um, if, if someone in, in my congregation, uh, hypothetically speaking, came and, and said, uh, I'm concerned maybe one of my, my children might be uh, gay or lesbian or born in, in, in the wrong body or something like that, um, I, I would uh, first just wanted to listen and to hear what they had to, to say and, and ask some questions and just to, to, to figure out a few, a few things. Um, I, I would want to, I guess, uh, reaffirm uh, that child is important in, in the sight of God and made in the image of God. And I would encourage the parents to, to love uh, their child, to love their children, uh, no matter um, what the, the child says, no matter what the, the, the struggles the child has or, or how they might identify themselves. So I would encourage them to love them. And your love uh, ought to be un unwavering. Uh, it's going to be challenged, um, but keep loving them. I would encourage uh, the parents uh, to uh, be and I hope all families do it, Christian families do it, is, is to um, have a time of devotion each day, to read the Bible with your children, to, to have conversations, keep pointing them to Jesus, because no matter who we are, whether we're straight or whatever we are, our ultimate identity is found in Christ. Our truest identity is found in Jesus. And so I want people to hear the message of Jesus as clearly as possible. I encourage the parents to keep loving their kids. Um, those feelings that, those children, that the children have, they may uh, dissipate over time. Uh, if, if it doesn't, then you might want to, we can talk about it then, but initially just love them, show them Jesus. Uh, and I would encourage the parents to be doing that discipling work rather than me as, as a pastor intervening at that point in time. Thank you very much, Murray. Um, can I just put this question um, uh, to Dr. Carolyn Norma? Um, the question uh, is, is put in this way. Um, can you please discuss the link between pushing gender theory in schools and the huge increase in children presenting with gender dysphoria? 
Yeah, th thanks, Dana. Thanks to the person who asked that good question. I saw it as well. Um, I think it's an important question because it answers why we're seeing such large numbers of children uh, channeling towards the gender clinics in Australia. Um, they, I think to, first to be said is that young people today uh, have been made very vulnerable on many fronts uh, through social media, through pornography exposure uh, and through other factors, um, particularly girls. Um, but on top of that vulnerability, uh, what we see is a level of social contagion, what's been suggested as social contagion occurring through social media, whereby the very idea that you can be born in the wrong body uh, has been promoted um, on, on particularly social, through social media channels. And I think that this is where the safe schools issue was in Victoria um, and, and promoted through other states comes in because this is a channeling of that um, mostly online social media promotion of that kind of idea of being born uh, the wrong, uh, in the wrong body uh, through institutional channels. Uh, and this takes the promotion of the idea to another level uh, because once a teacher uh, is saying uh, similar, making similar suggestions to children in schools, and um, according to the safe schools uh, package, those teachers were uh, teachers would be able to make such suggestion uh, without the uh, permission of parents. And in fact, in uh, in secrecy in parents in some cases, uh, that safe schools allowed that within their their um, suggestions. Um, what it means is uh, that then we have institutional backing for ideas like you can be born in the wrong body, and then we have ready and waiting uh, in uh, Australian children's hospitals, these gender clinics, which are uh, assumed to be the first port of call for uh, children uh, professing, professing things like gender identity. Um, and so the link is between, I think, um, social media chatter that's come from a lot, it's come from the United States actually, uh, through ideological groups in the United States, channeling that through social media and then finding an institutional base in places like schools through safe schools, I think. Thank you, Dr. Norma. Um, let's move to the next question. Questions will be for Professor Whitehall. Um, just. All right, so this is the question. Does the current draft have a minimum age limit on a child requesting such a change before they are deemed too young? Professor Whitehall. Um, according to the Australian guidelines, there are no age limits now. There used to be in the World Professional Association uh, guidelines that you shouldn't be giving cross-sex hormones, for example, under the age of 16 um, and, and blockers uh, around 12, I think. But the Australian guidelines did away with that. And the youngest person in Australia to go into puberty blockers was uh, 10 and a half years of age. Just a follow up question on that, uh, Professor Whitehall, is another question. Um, what are the rates of children having surgical interventions of gender reassignment? Uh, we, we don't know. Uh, the the uh, Family Court of Australia abrogated its gatekeeper role in this back in November 2018. Before that, you had to put your proposal to the family court uh, that yes, uh, my daughter uh, says she's a boy and, and she wants to have mastectomies. And then that came out in the court proceedings. So we know until that date that five girls had double mastectomies under the age of 18. Now, when the court has abrogated its role, it's a, a private matter between uh, between the girl and the uh, and the surgeon and the private hospital. Thank you, Professor Whitehall. I have two questions here. Um, Dan, you might want to take these two. Um, are you aware whether the submission on the conversion therapy proposed law has been reported back on? I understood that was due in February 20. Um, there's another question. How will the proposed religious discrimination bill interact with the Victorian bill? In the absence of you on jumping in, um, I understand that report has not been made available yet, uh, although it was expected in February. And um, 
uh, there were concerns raised by Premier Daniel Andrews that if the religious discrimination bill were passed, uh, that would um, uh, make his proposed ban on gay conversion uh, therapy um, not work. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, he's acknowledging, I think there's a clash that if people speak of their faith, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's faith that basically should not be spoken and should be banned. Um, can I ask a, a pastoral question? Um, and, and I think, um, Pastor Murray, you may have touched on this. What, what should we do if our child or even our grandchild has expressed a desire to be a different gender? What's a, an appropriate response? Um, first of all, uh, listen to your child and make sure that they know that they are being listened to and that they are loved. So you want to make sure that they feel safe and so that they can, this is not going to, it's not a one-off conversation. This is going to be a conversation possibly that, that goes for many weeks, months, or if not years. So I think you want you want to uh, be very careful. And though you might feel shocked or saddened at a whole range of emotions, just be very careful as to, to how we respond. Um, so show a lot of grace and love. I think set that kind of uh, basic uh, safe place for, you, for, your, for your child. And I would encourage them not to rush into anything. I would say, well, let, let, let's let's see and how, how you're going, you know, um, next month or next year. You, you, so I'd, I'd wait a bit and be, and because things do change. And we know that most children who struggle with gender dysphoria grow out of it by adulthood. Uh, so it, it's, it's not something that most children are going to struggle with for the rest of their lives. There are a few, but most don't. So I'm aware of that. Um, if, it, if it continues, um, then I'm, certainly I'd be wanting to, again, encourage them to, to be uh, reading the Bible, uh, thinking and looking to the person of Jesus, um, uh, sharing that there are things in this world, not everything is right, and uh, we, we, we struggle in different ways, um, and God understands that, and, and God loves us. All that, I, I think it's really important to reinforce and I guess I'm in a position where I know professionals who, who work in this field, whether it's psychiatrists and psychologists and, and so forth, you know, who I trust and I can and I can go to to speak to. And some of them are Christians. So I've got those resources available for me, which I understand not everyone would do. Um, if it's a prolonged issue, then it's probably important to go and see a, a pediatrician or a psychologist. But then we are, as we've heard tonight, um, that can start um, sending your child down a particular path that you believe is actually unsafe for them. So I think we, we want to be careful about that as well. But we do need to look after their, their, their whole well-being, their, their spiritual well-being, their physical well-being, emotional and mental well-being. Um, but understand it's going to be a journey. Yeah. So don't be afraid uh, that if not if it's not resolved quickly. Yep, thank you, Pastor Murray. This is another question for you as well as a pastor, and it's important for me for me as well, coming from a pastoral background. So um, any suggestion for a starting point for a conversation with one's minister or pastor? So basically, how do you start a conversation with our pastors on this issue? Sure, um, I would, uh, well, you won't be seeing them on Sunday probably because we're not allowed to meet. Um, I, I would I'd send them an email. Uh, or, or, or call them in this week and say, hey, I, I was, I went along to this uh, forum on, on uh, the other night, and uh, this important issue was raised, and, and I hear that the government is wanting to to ban conversion therapy. I found a little bit about it. It sounds really concerning, and that and might affect us a, a, as a church and what we teach from the Bible and how we pray. Um, can I uh, show you something? And then it's up to the pastor, of course, to 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 decide whether they're interested or, or not. But I would just just gently say, "Hey, heard this. Can you can I leave this with you? Send them maybe an article to read, a short article. I'm sure ACL have got something um, that that's appropriate to and it's nice and short and compact uh, to read. Uh, I've written a couple of articles on my blog, which are pretty accessible. Uh, so yeah, just introduce the conversation. Thank you. Um Professor John Whitehall, uh, a question for you. You know, you've mentioned puberty blockers and, uh, you know, that type of thing uh, to, um, uh, I suppose, um, uh, prevent somebody uh, uh, from, you know, maturing in their, their maleness or their femaleness, uh, that they might 
you know, get such a treatment if they go to a clinic. Um, the question is, do these interventions render a child sterile? Well, yes. Uh, yeah, they do. Of course, if you use a puberty blocker, it then uh, stops the cascade of hormones that would uh, initiate um, development of the testes or the, the ovary. There would be a definite secondary sterility with that. How long, that re how long the gonads remained inactive, no one exactly knows, uh, but they would, probably, uh, they would probably come back. That's the feeling. The other issue is if you use the sex hormones, you're giving estrogen uh, to a male that uh, also that actually suppresses the gonads themselves. And uh, it is likely that sooner, if not later, uh, the gonads would give up the ghost. Now, no one really knows how long this will take, but the evidence that it does happen is that most of the gender dysphoria clinics advise that if you want to have children later on, then we're going to take, need to take a biopsy of your ovary or your testes and freeze it uh, and then unfreeze it so that later on you can become pregnant through uh, in vitro fertilization. So the very fact that they emphasize that shows you that sterility is, um, is certainly likely. Now, if you go the whole hog and have sex reassignment surgery, castration and removal of all the uh, genitalia of your other uh, your other identity that's in, that's integral to it it's part of it so yes there is chemical and there is surgical castration thank you professor whitehall um dr norma this is a question for you is there an explanation as to why the majority of gender dysphoria cases as mentioned by dr norma is attributed to biologically female 75 percent there's not a social scientific uh, research based empirical explanation of that yet because a lot of research in the area is discouraged because of the issues that we were talking about about demonization and the rest um, but we only have to think about the situation that we've got girls in today even in australia whereby we've got rising rates of sexual assault in uh, the young age cohort against uh, girls that's statistically shown uh, we've got high levels of exposure to pornography that's historically unprecedented. Uh, we've got issues in schools of sex-based and sexualizing uh, bullying and other practices. Um, why wouldn't these girls want to rid themselves of secondary uh, sex characteristics in particular? Why wouldn't they ha want to hide themselves as female um, in an environment in some cases that's extremely hostile to um, young women in particular and unfortunately they're getting from the internet and they're getting even from their schools the idea that um, you can escape the, the hardships of your sex class by uh, yeah, so-called uh, thinking of yourself as being trapped in uh, the wrong body and in fact we, we could even say yes the girls are trapped in the wrong body because those bodies are actually um, abused and hurt uh, for, for being female. Uh, so in a sense, in a sociological sense, yes, they are trapped in the wrong bodies, but uh, certainly there is, certainly transgenderism gives those girls absolutely nothing in terms of um, a, a solution and a, a, um, a constructive way to uh, overcome the hardships of, of belonging to the group of, of women. Dr. Dr. Norma, uh, and I think you may have touched on this in your presentation, um, does this proposed ban also violate the rights of LGBT people to choose the kind of supports that they seek out? Yeah, I, I like this question too. Um, I'd need more time to think about it. I, I think that for the, probably the, the fundamental point to be made and, uh, and the one that I made in my presentation was that so you, under the affirmation model in uh, if, if it's played out, you don't get the option to be gay uh, because you're, in the case of uh, a young woman, you're um, transitioned into, so supposedly transitioned into a constructed male, so sociologically. Uh, now, you can't be a lesbian if you're uh, imagining yourself to be male, if you're 
supposedly recognised in society as male, that stamps out uh, being a, a lesbian. So uh, treatment options, the issue obviously is that um, a high percentage of uh, young people presenting with issues of I was born in the wrong body type issues uh, are shown statistically that they will go on to be uh, lesbian or gay. Um, there's, there's various explanations, there's various discussions to have about why that is the case. We can put that aside for the minute. It is just statistically the case. And therefore the, the prospect that number one, they get, never get a chance to be a lesbian because they are sort of moved into a constructed male social role, or as John Professor Whitehall um, has spoken about, uh, they're castrated, uh, sterilized, um, then uh, that's also an attack on um, their, their being as, as lesbians or gay men. All right, let's move to the next question. Thank you, Dr. Norma. Um, this question asks, I think a lot of people get the image of gay conversion therapy from movies like Boy Erase or stories like the one Professor Whitehall mentioned that inappropriate or even inhumane method was used and led them to harm or even life lost. Thus, a lot of people are opposed to the idea. What can we as Christian respond to this general impression? As a Christian, I, I do understand it is not common and I had never seen anything like this in Australia, but that doesn't sound like a very strong argument. Probably um, Pastor Murray want to answer this question? Uh, sure, well, I guess like what I said to the, the ABC journal, uh, when, when he was sharing with me, and I said, this is the first I've ever heard of this practice. So I think that that does communicate something, the fact that I'm uh, personally ignorant uh, or unaware that this is a practice. And it's not like I'm living in, in a little bubble, but, um, you know, again, I, I, I'm engaging with uh, Christian churches and leaders all over the country, all, all the time. And, and this was a brand new thing to me. And the, one of the reports does cite 15 individuals who said that they had some or experienced some sort of conversion uh, therapy, uh, whether it's exorcisms and, and, and prayer and and, thing, and so forth. Um, now, I, I don't doubt that they're, what they say is true, and, and I have no reason to to doubt that. Um, but it, it, again, the, the, the fact that the study itself came up with only 15 people um, after the the organisers of, of that study, you know, pursued that relentlessly, uh, trying to get people to come forward. Um, that I think that signals that the number of times or people that have been affected by this is incredibly small, and, and then and it, it doesn't evidence seems suggests that it's not really a practice now in in Victoria. Um, and you can and if someone says I went through that, empathise with them and says that that sounds awful. That's what. Christians don't believe that we shouldn't be doing that. Um, so I'd, I'd empathize them and, and, and then use it as an opportunity to show what Christianity is about um, if, if they have themselves gone through such a, 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 an experience. Thank you. <clears throat> um, just before I go to Jasmine to ask the last question, um, I'm noticing that there's a question in, uh, is there support for this legislation from both the major political parties in Victoria? That's a very, very good question. And it is our concern that politicians, uh, both of conservative um, uh, bent as well as uh, on the left side of politics, are completely ignorant about this. And um, when a conservative politician has a microphone put in front of their face and asked, uh, you know, do you support gay conversion therapy? They'll generally say, no, uh, no, I don't. You know, it's it's harmful. And um, you know, we have been hearing that uh, from the Victorian Liberal opposition. So this, this shows how much work is to be done. So this is uh, going to be ALP policy and the Liberal Party opposition, are, you, you know, they're, they're an open book on this. We don't know where they'll go. So it's a very important educational process we're involved in. Uh, so we will make sure that we are getting material out to you and to the members of parliament on this. Could I just go to Jasmine for our last question? Yes, yeah, so it seems that we only have time for the last one. So this is a very important one for Christian. This is how the question go. If this law is passed as per the discussion paper, could it shut down churches, Christian schools and Christian organization? Pastor Murray, this is for you. 
Oh, um, well, I don't know the answer because I, I haven't seen the uh, legislation yet. Uh, I, I know that Stuart Lindsay, who's a, a retired federal court uh, judge, uh, he wrote an article a few months ago and, and suggested that uh, if you engage in conversion practices, you could be imprisoned for up to 18 months. And I think a, a similar situation in Queensland. So uh, imprisonment is, is possibly on the cards. Uh, and, that, and that's someone in that field who is suggesting that that may be uh, an outcome. Um, beyond that, I, I, I don't want to guess at the moment. I guess we'll wait and see uh, what, what the law says. But, but, I, I, but if it's banned, uh, you know, if, if prayer or certain Bible teaching is, is prohibited uh, and then someone you know, says, aha, you've been doing it, uh, and then there's going to be some sort of repercussion. But what that will be, uh, we'll wait and find out. My um, I just it means we should be as churches and, and Christian schools concerned for sure may I just butt in very quickly and say that I would say I would answer that even more strongly and say that the point of this exaggeration is the closure of a Christian church thank you very much professor um, I wonder if you join with me now you know uh, Zoom way of uh, thanking our very uh, wonderful panel tonight. Uh, we've had such diverse perspectives and, um, you know, I think very confident deliveries uh, with, you know, just great information. Uh, and, you know, I note uh, the courage of uh, all of our uh, academic panel who have spoken tonight. Um, so I want to particularly thank our panel. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us. I also want to thank our producer, Linda, our director, Sarah, and the originator of this forum, uh, Victoria's acting state director, Jasmine Yuen. Uh, we might just go to you, Pastor Murray, to uh, close in prayer, and that will conclude our event this evening. Yep, sure. Our Father in heaven, uh, the world in which we live is an astonishing place, is wonderfully made, and we know that each person has been crafted in your image and is uniquely made. Uh, Father, we can be blown away by the world with its rich beauty and depth, and, and yet we're also saddened by the suffering and the sin that we see around us and even in our own lives. Uh, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life for us on the cross, that we might be reconciled to you and that to find our, our truest and greatest identity in him. Father, help us to love others as you have loved us. Help us to speak to social issues with clarity and gentleness. And on this matter of conversion therapy, we do pray that we can speak into this issue with truth and love. And we ask that we can persuade those in the, in the halls of parliament to take a different course of action to the one that perhaps is being settled on. Uh, we ask that churches and religious groups around Victoria will be able to keep their freedoms to teach and practice in accordance with their faith. And we pray that our churches will be safe communities where people can come and investigate the good news of Jesus, no matter what their sexuality is. We pray that they might find a safe place to share with the, their wrestles with the big questions of life. And Father, I want to thank you for everyone who's been listening tonight. And, and I ask for your gracious blessing upon them. Equip us to love and serve you faithfully and to love our neighbours as ourselves. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless.